I'll have visual aids, um, but basically, please consider them to be hearing aids, as I'm not a native speaker of English, as you immediately will have recognized. Um, I'd like to go back to the Fry and Osborne paper that, uh, in a sense, triggered the whole symposium. Um, a good point, perhaps, is to realize that we have already been here before. In 1964, a high-level U.S. ad hoc committee concluded what they called the Cyber Nation Revolution would result in a system of almost unlimited productive capacity which requires progressively less human labor. And reacting to the report, President Johnson said the words that are on my slide, automation will be the ally of our prosperity if we just, if we just look ahead, if we will understand what is to come, and if we set our course wisely uh, after proper planning for the future. So there are basically three tasks. We have to look ahead, we have to understand what is to come, and we have to do some proper planning for the future. But each of these tasks is more complicated than the words of Johnson in 1964 suggested. Basically, in the past decades, for good reasons, we have become more skeptical about the ability of experts to look ahead. Uh, there is abundant evidence that experts' predictions, especially of long-term social, political, and technological development, are as bad as anybody else's speculation. The problem that I want to address is if we cannot seriously look ahead and how are we to understand what we have, what is to come, and how do we prepare for the future? The other two tasks of Johnson's list, to mitigate the trans transition and to prevent severe unintended negative aspects, such as mass unemployment. And why do we continue to listen to experts, although we know that their predictions are as bad as anybody else's? speculation. That's the questions that I'd like to discuss in the coming 20 minutes. Okay, so what is the role, these are the three questions that I want to do, what is the role of experts in the political process, what should we understand and focus on, and how should or can or do politicians proceed if they want to plan for the future? These are the questions I would like to address, and before turning to the Frey and Osborne paper uh, about the, the future of employment, I need to do some groundwork. We live in what Castells has called the network society. But that notion of network society requires some discussion because the, the concept of a network can be used in two entirely different meanings. Most often, network is used to refer to a system or an arrangement of interconnected elements in the world out there. So we speak of social networks of people that in one way or another are linked to each other. And we speak of the network that um, uh, delivers uh, natural gas from Russia into uh, the stoves in uh, Western Europe. Let's call that network number one. However, in a remote uh, island in the big ocean that we call the social sciences, called actor network theory, the concept of network has an entirely different use. It's namely used as a tool for describing what we encounter in the world at large, not only that what we conventionally usually call a network, but also what we tend to conceive as individual elements or objects. Let's call that network number two. I'll skip all the details and we'll use a very simple few, very simple examples to um, illustrate what I mean. Think for a moment about your car. It's a thing, an object, an artifact that enables easy transport. Now, 
transfer, transfer in your imagination your car to, say, the 16th century. How far will you get? After 200 kilometers, the, uh, it will have run off out of petrol. Nobody in the whole world can provide you with a refill. The organization to produce oil and to turn into petrol is not present. So outside of the context of a society, your car is not the thing you took it for so far. It exists as an artifact that enables easy transport only when the organization that uh, shell company has been uh, available. To properly function, your car needs a kind of ecosystem. It needs to be linked up with many other elements. To properly function, it has to be networked number two. Now, when you speak about your car as an individual object rather than as a networked element, you take for granted everything that it needs to be set up for its function. You have to take have to, uh, to, uh, taken that for granted. Now, for most purposes, that doesn't matter, but sometimes it does. Simple: How far does your car go? Fast does your car go? The meter on the dashboard perhaps says 200 kilometers per hour. In practice taking a mix of motorway transport and city tra uh, traffic, an occasional jam, perhaps 60 kilometers per hour will become closer. But hold on. To use your car, you have to buy one. And to have it run in, running, you have to pay for petrol and for taxes and for insurance and repairs and so on. You have to work long hours to, uh, for all of that. Now, you have to add that, those hours to the hours that you have been sitting in a car to reach your destination. Now, what's then the average uh, speed of a car? Illich, in the 1960s, did a calculation. In the 1960s, the Americans, Americans drove, on average, 12,000 kilometers per year, adding up all the hours they had to spend in the car and on the car. Uh, Elish concluded that Americans spent annually 1,600 hours in and on their car. So the average speed of American cars in the 1960s was 7.5 kilometers per hour, which is slightly uh, faster than just walking. Now, we tend to identify many things in terms of their intended effects or in their functions, not only technologies. Just one final example, and then we'll go to real stuff. Imagine a skipper who has to sail through difficult waters to reach a harbor. To calculate a safe journey, he uses a lot of equipment, compass, maps, a nautical slide rule, radio to see uh, signals from, from beacons, and so on and so forth. Now, when we concentrate on the outcome, the intended function of his activities, a safe journey, that is to say, a safe journey to the harbor, the instruments appear as amplifying the skipper's cognitive abilities. They are his little helpers. But Hutchins, a cognitive scientist and anthropologist, observed when we shift our focus to the process by which cognitive work is accomplished, we see something quite different. Rather than amplify the cognitive abilities, these tools transform the task the person has to do. The instruments make the skipper do things that he would otherwise not have done. So who is in control and where is the competence to safely sail a boat into the harbor? Where is it located? We, think to, we tend to think about competence as something located in our mind, but in second sort, it turns out to be distributed over many elements that include surely the skipper's cognitive abilities, but also his instruments. By speaking of technologies and competence as given things with clear function, we identify implicitly that thing together with a specific framing. 
that we commit what Whitehead, Cambridge philosopher, has called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. We treat an abstraction as if it is a complete description of that thing. Now, to avoid this fallacy of con misplaced concreteness doesn't require rocket science. We simply have to shift language, to shift from talking about intended and unintended effects to talking about the setup that is required to properly act, operate, to function, and etc. And by using network as a tool for description, that setup is highlighted. If we do that and use network as a tool for describing, every society is a network society. What makes our society, the society Castells calls the network society, stand out from other societies is not that we are networked and the others are not, but the length of the links we have set up, the stability, their durability. They allow us to do what modern people do, to function, to act at a distance, to join forces, to reliably transfer, compare, and combine information, all of which allows us to competently fulfill ever more complicated tasks. That is to say, up to the point where our bosses discovered that was an even more sophisticated setup, machines can be introduced to perform the same function after which we are made redundant. So let's now look at the Frey and Osborne paper. Those of you, uh, I guess most of you will have looked at the paper, its purpose is clear. It estimates the job, which jobs are susceptible to computerization, that is job automation by means of computer control equipment. The outcome has been widely cited. 47% uh, of total US employment is in the high risk category of computerization. Becomes, because computers are expected to be able in the near future to take over many non-routine tasks, that figure includes a lot of middle-class jobs. What drives this computerization? The authors don't spill many words on this question. They point to cost reduction, labor costs go up, cost of computer equipment will uh, go down, and they hand, hint at two other benefits of computerizations. In the first place, Computers' absence of human biases. The, 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 the explanation is quite uh, funny, in fact. Humans need rest breaks. They have lapses of concentration, and they have irrational cognitive biases, of which algorithms, the authors claim, are free. Finally, second place, they point to the scalability of computer networks resulting in excessive power, excessive power to process enormous amounts of data, enabling computers to take up ever more complicated tasks. So the intended effects of computerization are pretty clear. Low cost plus higher quality products and services, the dream of every uh, entrepreneur, and of course also consumers will benefit from these intended effects behind computerization, the invisible hand of the market uh, is um, effective. The unintended effects fall to the workers. Their uh, jobs will be at risk, and in the paper, the workers are supposed to be sitting duck, waiting for their bosses to substitute computers for them. Now, if we look at the Frey and Osborne paper, which I summarized, it perfectly fits into the three tasks included in the president, uh, in the remarks President Johnson uh, made I, that I have quoted be, uh, before. It looks into the future, it helps to understand what we need to understand, and it also suggests in passing how we may prepare for that future. Regulation, regulatory concerns and political activism may slow down the process of computerization, 
and to cope with the process, education is the answer. Uh, for workers, this is a quote, for workers to win the race against computerization, they will have to acquire creative and social skills because on those two variables, the threshold for overcoming current engineering bottlenecks are assessed as still being relatively high. Sauf qui peut, as the French say. Now, what's left out of the argument? And that's what I want to focus on. It's, it's a straightforward argument. Of course, one may question the assumptions introduced in the argument, for example, the estimates about what computers will be able to do in the upcoming decade or two. And one might quite question the calculations and the outcome. But I don't want to do that. What I want to do is to question the framing of the argument. And I want to discuss how leaving out what I have called before the setup, to focus only on intended and unintended effects will limit our policy uh, options. What is left out of the argument? There is no need to fantasize. In fact, Frey and Osborne touch upon many points that show that both uh, workers and computers are more networked too, in a sense, than acknowledged. Let's review a few. Let's do some nitpicking that is close reading. And some of the first workers and some of the, the uh, comments uh, are in agreement with what David Susskind uh, just said. Workers have, in this paper, have jobs. What are jobs? Jobs are spots on the labor market. The labor market is segmented into occupations, and occupations come with tasks that can be performed either by a worker or by a machine. Now, to an individual looking for a job, the labor market may indeed present itself as a set of unconnected spots. But in fact, of course, jobs are interconnected. Each relies on the products or services of other jobs. Changes in one occupation uh, will have effects on other occupations, either upstream or downstream the value chain. And in the network society, Castell's network society, with a long ch value chain, this is, in effect, not to be neglected. Tasks will be risk redistributed along the value chain. Remember, for those who are old enough, in the 1960s, all universities and big companies had rooms full of typists. The typists have gone, but typing as an activity hasn't. Today, the the task of typing is redistributed over many for this task, mostly unskilled workers, such as academics. So typists plus typewriters have been replaced by unskilled workers, namely academics, plus word processors. That process is badly covered by the phrase substitute computers for workers, I think. Now turn to the computers. We may point again, just on the basis of the text of this paper, to some other missing links. To perform perception tasks, computers require not only sensors, but a relatively structured environment. If necessary, within a company's building, that can be provided. Frey and Osborne, for example, refer to Amazon's warehouse where barcodes, stickers are placed on the floor to inform robots of their precise location. Elsewhere, is, it is more complicated. As the authors note, houses present a much more unstructured environment, especially my house, full of objects. To allow computers to function, the world has to be made ready for them. If you want a robot butler in your home, you have to radically clean out your house first. Secondly, to perform intelligent tasks, computers need data, lots of them. So further computerization of occupations also depends on the availability of big data infrastructures and on the networks of computers to increase their processing power. 
to coordinate all of that, the introduction of standards and norms will be essential. Finally, it's the third uh, example, quoting uh, Margaret Bowden, Frey and Osborne note that the principal obstacle to computerization, to, to compu computerizing creativity, is stating our creative values sufficiently clearly that they can be encoded in a program. What's the problem? The authors note that human values are highly variable. They conclude, in the absence of an engineering solution to overcome this problem, it seems unlikely that occupations requiring a high degree of creative intelligence will be automated, automated in the next decades. But of course, there are easier solutions. You simply redefine the values in a way such that they can be processed. And that's what companies and universities have done to assess the productivity of their creative workers. So even if we limit ourselves to the points that Frey and Osborne bring up in passing, we may expect computerization to have effects on labor markets, on technology, and on the ecosystem that left, are left out of the calculations of Frey and, and Osborne. How this will affect their calculations and the outcome of the calculations is completely unclear. But as I said before, the purpose of bringing this up is not to criticize the predictions. I think they are as good as anybody else's forecasts. That is pure speculation. But by framing the investigation in terms of intended and unintended effects, that is, by leaving out the consideration that needs to be set up, our view on the available policy options is limited. And that's what I want to go into now. <clears throat> Having received this paper of Frey and Osborne, what should politicians do? What can they do? And before going into that, perhaps we should first ask the question, what do they actually do? What do politicians do? Let's be realistic about modern politics. Modern politics takes place in hybrid conferences, in city halls, in ministerial departments, and in international organizations. And in those rooms, politicians, scientists, experts in urban development, engineers, lawyers, economists, and what else do we have, meet up to discuss an issue. What is an issue? An issue is a topic about which uncertainty is, exists and about which people take different sides. Even when experts are not uh, present in person, for example, in parliament or in a cabinet meeting, they have a say. Their reports are on the table and if not their reports, then at least a one-page summary of their views. Now, experts and politicians in modern politics team up in a joint effort. What do they discuss? The two questions that are on the slide. What has to be taken into account? And how to arrange all of that into order to live better? So the discussions will be both backward-looking, discussing what has to be taken into account, and forward-looking, speculating on how to put everything in order. All contribute to these both questions, experts and politicians alike. Just observe a contemporary political process in, in, in a city hall or in a ministry. Now, to answer the second question, may require an enormous variety of, of measures. Technical facilities may have to be designed. Rights and burdens have to be redistributed. Perhaps new forms of behavior have to be facilitated and stimulated, etc. Just so to get there, a lot of discussion and the input of a wide variety of expertise is needed. Of course, there are differences but in this process between the roles of the scientific experts and of politicians. But I do think that to detect these differences, the traditional distinction between facts and value is a very crude and useless tool. If you want to 
differentiate between those rules, you should better look to the skills and the instruments that each brings uh, to the job and to the various ways in which the uh, participants are held accountable for, what, for their input. That also um, helps to differentiate between the different kind of experts that are active in uh, political uh, uh, processes. So typically, scientists will defend their contribution by referring back to theories and scientifically uh, established facts and interpretations and suggestions, whereas politicians have to operate, at least in democratic societies, within a system of checks and balances. Politicians know that whatever decision is taken, it will be reconsidered again in a different assembly or in a public meeting. So in the meeting, in a political meeting, politicians judge whatever is brought to the table on, I think, a simple criterion. Will it, will, will it uh, still hold water in the next meeting when they have to confront other politicians, other experts, a journalist, or a few members of the party in some meeting in a backwater village on a Saturday afternoon? Well, politicians have to defend a decision in the next meeting. The experts are not accountable for decisions in, that are taken. If questions, they will say it was a political decision, not a scientific one. Even if their contributions consisted of predictions that turn out to have completely missed the mark, they will not be held contempt, uh, accountable for them. Next time, they are invited again at the table. Why? Because they play an essential role. We need them to answer the two questions that are central to the political process. Experts will continue to frame their contribution in disciplinary terms. Psychologists will locate competence in our minds and Economists will continue to speak about jobs as spots on labor markets, and all of them will speculate about the future. But once a multitude, multitude of disciplines is gathered around the table, if it's an open discussion, and of course that's a big if, a wide variety of aspects will be taken into account and explored. So hire experts, lots of them, and let them confront each other. All relevant voices have to be assembled. Given that politicians operate within a system of checks and balances, if they fail to organize the political process in compliance with this requirement, they may expect to run into trouble in the next meeting. Politics has a bad name. It's an unruly process. But I think that is the wrong view on the purpose of this process. We expect from politics transparency. But that's not the purpose of this process. The process is, I think, to try to collectively try avoiding the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. So a lot of aspects will be taken into account. But I think that we, especially in a network uh, society like Castells, the links deserve more attention, especially when technologies are discussed. And that's the, sort of the topic here. The networks that allow them to function, to uh, technology to function, may extend over long distances, exceeding the jurisdiction of political institutions. Your car depends on oil drilled somewhere in the Middle East. And to enable the robot to provide smart home care for elderly persons, not only the robot, but also the elderly person's house has to be equipped with lots of sensors that produce data that have to be processed and compared with data collected elsewhere back to the, and brought back to the, to the robot. Where is the processing done? Who is responsible? Perhaps some company in the US and the service may be located anywhere. To allow robots to work, large networks have to be set up. 
And so the, the question we have to ask, I think, is can politi politicians influence or decide about the setup of these networks and can they decide it for the common good? Not only the fact that the networks involved may probably and do probably exceed uh, their, uh, their jurisdiction, but also the fact that networks have power that established political institutions will have difficulty to cope, will complicate the job of the politicians. Let me go into that for a few minutes. Networks require standards, require norms for their coordination. They can be established either by some party's ex explicit decision or by what is called aggregate decision making, that is the accumulation of freely taken individual actions to join. No doubt standardization and norms and so are often beneficial. Think, for example, about the G uh, GSM standard instituted by the European Commission, a public authority. Private standards can do some good. For example, the private standards for food safety of the British retail consortium all keep us healthy. But networks have network effects. They become more valuable when more participants join the network. As an effect, networks show what is called network power. Once a network is in full operation it, and its standards are established, individuals have the free choice to either join up and comply to the standards or to be excluded. Nobody forces them to comply, but not doing so will be costly. It means exclusion, isolation. That's network power. Not force, not persuasion, but the effect of large numbers. Network power creates new kinds of monopolies, namely monopolies of norms and standards that may operate without a clear monopolist. To counter network power, one may in search in vain to look for leverage points, one of the questions that the organizers asked us. Note that when I'm talking about networks and standards, I don't only talk about computer networks and software standards. Computerization of services and production will require standardization of computer communication, of information feed fed to uh, databases, of sensor computer interaction, but also in many cases of the environment in which the, oper the robots have to operate. Now, to counter network power, there is one clear, simple answer. You have to establish other net alternative networks to secure that there is a choice. There are some slightly less radical answers. That is, for example, to demand that standards are compatible with others or malleable, malleable by what innovation economists call the challenges, which in the case of computer software uh, basically comes down to requiring or demanding open source software. But in many cases, all of that is politically an uphill battle because the standards that dominate the backbones of the ecosystem that allow technologies, especially computer technologies to function, are com complex assemblies of both public and private norms. Now, how to con I do think this is one of the key issues that is uh, for, the, for the next uh, time, how to cope with network power. One suggestion I'd like to do here is to review competition law. Current competition law focuses on market dominance of individual firms and on the effect of consumer prices. But increasingly, competition needs instruments to uh, take, competition takes place between networks and standards. Governments need instruments to counterbalance monopolies that emerge without a clear individual monopolist. And they have to assess the, uh, to have to assess a broader criteria than just consumer prices. So let's just look at the policy options that we have. 
the future will get shaped in small steps. So what can politicians do to prepare for the future? And I do think that an important minimal uh, uh, requirement is they keep the future more open than it would be without their interference. So to allow some choice. The first thing they should do is let the experts discuss what has to be taken into account and let them speculate and think about how everything could be put in. Uh, let them correct each other and then let them put them into order. For this, there are standard things. Of course, you can regulate things. If you want, for safety reasons, uh, you want to regulate driverless car, it's a simple rule, allow those cars only on the road on speeds below 30 km kilometers per hour. That will curb the introduction of the car. But more likely, the regulation will go the other way. We have to, uh, to adapt, adapt ourselves to the introduction of the cars. So if the number of accidents of driverless cars with elderly people or small kids increase, the law will be introduced demanding toddlers and elderly people to wear overcoats that can be detected by sensors of driverless cars. The second thing, of course, is that as soon as negative consequences, you can compensate them. We have been discussing this uh, this afternoon before. And the third one is we can educate people to cope with the computerization. But to be honest, I think all of that is small beer. It focuses on the intended and unintended effects only and leaves a setup untouched. If we want to prepare for the future, I think we have to shift focus and to get that setup in view. And the real challenge here is to cope with network power, the count of, po of power that is not easily counted by the resources of power currently available to states. That is what's coming, and that is what, to use President Johnson's remark I started with, we need to understand. And to prepare for the future, we need to build up counter power. So for a start, stimulate and facilitate the development of other networks. That is innovation policy. Demand compatible and malleable standards. That is, demand open and stimulate and facilitate open software. And in the third place, I think we really need to th rethink competition law because it is no longer adapted to the world in which we are living now. <laughs>